Quick disclaimer before starting, this video is not encouraging anyone to engage in any form of illegal activity. On the contrary, this video is discouraging people from engaging in the activities depicted in the 2022 film, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. On the 10th of September 2022, at the Toronto International Film Festival, How to Blow Up a Pipeline first premiered. It was subsequently released to general audiences in April 2023, receiving critical acclaim in spite of its provocative name and subject matter. However, seasoned political activists might notice that there are some serious issues with the film that, if replicated, could lead to young activists getting themselves severely hurt or potentially even losing their lives. Specifically, the way explosives are created in this film, if replicated, will cause the bombs to explode prematurely, damaging no pipelines, just hurting activists themselves. This is especially alarming when we take into consideration the fact that this specific aspect of the film was made in consultation with high-ranking US military officials who specialize in counter-terrorism. So today, we'll be joined by a seasoned Irish Republican veteran, Donald O'Kushtala, to discuss what precisely is wrong with this film on a technical level, and how these specific dangerous practices will lead to severe harm to anyone who attempts to replicate them in real life. We hope that this discussion will help prevent people from getting hurt, particularly younger activists who don't know any better. Please share this video widely, as it could help save lives. Now, before we get into the technicalities, let's briefly take a look at the background. So, what is how to blow up a pipeline? In 2021, Andreas Malm, a Swedish author, professor, and left-wing activist, released a non-fiction book named How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Rather than being the how-to guide that it might appear to be in its title, the book instead simply makes an argument that the environmental movement needs to escalate beyond pacifism and non-violence into the realm of property destruction. Specifically, property that's polluting and destroying the planet, like oil and gas pipelines. It makes the argument that this kind of polluting property is killing the planet and killing people. So destruction of this property can only be correctly understood as a form of self-defense. The book makes a clear distinction between destruction of property on the one hand, which it deems appropriate in the context of climate activism, and violence against people on the other, which it absolutely opposes in this context. Further, Andreas Malm argues that any property destruction that occurs must be deeply rooted among mass movements, rather than small isolated terror cells which appoint themselves as substitutes for mass action. However, what's significant about this book for our discussion today is that the book doesn't explain in detail how to actually engage in destruction of property. And it certainly doesn't teach you how to create and use explosives or anything like that. So with this in mind, nothing in Andreas Malm's book itself merits being treated with suspicion and should be engaged with sincerely. The movie, on the other hand, provides massive cause for concern. Director and producer Daniel Goldhaber read Andreas Malm's book in 2021 and was immediately inspired to create a fictional film that would dramatize and put into action some of the ideas discussed in that book. The movie depicts a group of young people from various walks of life who come together to blow up an oil pipeline in Texas using homemade explosives, with the overarching goal of making oil unviable as a source of energy to be sold on the market. And so that's what they do. They get together and they blow up an oil pipeline. But here's where things get really suspicious. The film presents all of this in a positive, sympathetic light essentially encouraging young activists to follow the lead of the main characters of the film to engage in what the US government would classify as eco-terrorism. Keeping in mind that this is a small group of activists who are completely detached from any kind of larger revolutionary mass movement, Marxists would describe this as adventurism, which is completely at odds with the kind of mass-oriented action emphasized by Andreas Malm himself. While the encouragement of this kind of adventurous activity is implicit in the movie itself by presenting the main characters in such a sympathetic light, 
highlighting how each has their own backstory about how they were negatively affected by oil pipelines and justifying their actions as self-defense against climate catastrophe. The movie's official website explicitly encourages viewers to quote, take action and quote, act outside the system. The same page also includes a comprehensive map of US gas and oil pipelines. You can use your imagination about what they're suggesting with that. So it's not just a film that's solely meant to be enjoyed for art's sake or for entertainment. Activists are actively being encouraged to take action from it. The film ostensibly shows viewers how to create homemade explosives that could be used in such action. However, if someone in real life attempted to replicate what's shown in the film's depiction of bomb making, they'd get severely hurt and perhaps worse. What's most suspicious about this is that it's not simply a case of the people creating the film not knowing what they're doing. Director Daniel Goldhaber openly admits that the film was made in consultation with an anonymous high-ranking US military official who specializes in counter-terrorism. No, really, listen for yourself. The only other thing I'll say is like we we did have uh, expert consultation on the movie, uh, which for for two reasons. One, we wanted to get it right, but there, there was a uh, there's a technical advisor credited as anonymous, who's a somebody who's very high up in counterterrorism in the United States military, uh, who's requested to remain anonymous, but who we worked with both to get everything accurate and also to make sure that we weren't doing anything dangerous by putting anything in the movie. Um, it was kind of it was kind of both things, you know. We wanted to get it right, but we also didn't want to like do something bad uh, by making the film. And so he was somebody who, who you know, was very, very interested for professional reasons and kind of also motivating, motivating a conversation about how easily accessible bombs are to make. And uh, also, I think from a nerdy perspective, is always annoyed that they're never made right in movies and wanted, <laughs> wanted to see it done right for once. The US military official played an important role in informing how the creation of homemade explosives would be depicted in this film. And the result of this consultation is that what the film shows is extremely dangerous and will hurt or even kill those who attempt to replicate it, as will be discussed later by our guest Dono. Another concerning and bizarre element of the film is its portrayal of informants. In the film, they work with a known FBI informant in such a way that benefits the group. As a film for activists, this is encouraging viewers to keep informants around, naively suggesting that they can be utilized to the movement's advantage in a way that benefits everyone. However, anyone who studied revolutionary movements historically would know that this can never be the case. So there are numerous causes for suspicion of this film. But the question that needs to be asked then is, to what degree are the filmmakers aware that the ideas they're spreading could badly harm radical movements? Is this simply just extreme naivety? Have they been manipulated by US military officials? What's actually going on here? Well, we're not going to pretend that we have all the answers, but we are going to discuss the facts. So today we're joined by Donald Okushtala to get deeper insights into some of the more suspicious aspects of this film's production. Donald is a socialist Republican who did a full jail sentence in Portleash Prison for membership of the Irish Republican Army. Donald has a bachelor's degree in electronics and electrical control systems, an honours degree in sustainable design engineering, and has just finished his master's degree thesis in systems engineering and engineering cybernetics. Needless to say, with his experience and expertise, Donald brings a wealth of theoretical and practical knowledge to the table on this matter. Donald, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you very much for taking the time out to share your important insights with us about the potentially dangerous issues that this film presents. Thanks, Paul. It's good to be with you. So, Donald, speaking generally now, what concerns you most about this film? Right. So I would say my big problem with this film is simply that anyone that would try to emulate what's shown there is going to get themselves seriously injured or sent to jail for a very long time. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the filmmakers were trying to do really with this film. and I'm a bit perplexed by it all. Um, if you just step back and look at the overall plot, what it's supposed to be advocating to me is kind of nonsense. Um, so you have a group, a small group of individuals or friends and for them to go out and try to do something like this on their own, virtually never going to end well. 
And I think, as you've mentioned already, this was not the intention of the uh, author of the book of the same name. So the film is quite a separate issue. The story that they end up telling in the film is this absurd situation where the FBI are shown as kind of idiots and the group um, succeeds in their plan, regardless of the fact that they have been infiltrated from the beginning and that they know they're infiltrated. And then at the end, the FBI arrest these two people who wanted to be arrested anyway. And none of it really makes any sense. So if there was a drop of reality, just a modicum of reality in this film, what you would see instead is everyone involved being arrested and sent to prison realistically, probably for life or else killed, uh, of course, at that farmhouse where they were making these devices. And the sabotage would have been stopped. People can say, well, look, it's just supposed to be a kind of, it's just a film, it's just a lighthearted thing, but that isn't how it's being presented. And I think that's why it's so concerning. Yeah, there's a point in the film where one of the lads is reading the original book in the library, uh, Andreas Malm's How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And one of the other characters approaches the fellow who's reading the book and he says, oh, it's a great book, but uh, it doesn't actually show you how to do that, how to blow up the pipeline. And so the implication then is that the film or the people in the film are the alternative that are actually going to show you how to do that. And the film really seems to pride itself on being that alternative, you know. Uh, this actually does show you how to do that, you know. This is the uh, US military approved guideline for how to correctly do uh, eco-terrorism, essentially. <laughs> you know, <laughs> who wouldn't trust that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, I wanted to ask, what specifically were the unsafe parts of this film that jumped out to you most? And again, particularly with regard to this process of making explosives and handling explosives in the film. Okay, sure. So um, the first thing I want to say is that any of the kind of um, observations that I've made about this film, I think could be made easily by anyone. You know, a lot of the a lot of the things in this film are just uh, totally unsafe, obviously unsafe kind of procedures. And you don't need a technical background to see that. But where I do mention some technical things, it's stuff that you can easily learn from publicly available books and stuff like that. So there's no special knowledge here. And because there is no special knowledge, I really don't think there's any excuse as to why the filmmakers portrayed a lot of the things as they did. Now, before talking about the actual scenes themselves, um, I, I just want to draw the viewer's attention to what I think is the most important point here, um, because I think it leads to this to to a lot of these dangerous scenes that we see. The 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 group of individuals that is shown in the film as this cell of activists are totally disconnected from their community, their society, even from the environmentalist movement itself. And where does that lead them to? It leads them to a situation where they have to go and buy mixtures of chemicals from pharmacies and hardware stores and shops if they're going to make these IEDs that they want to make. And, you know, honestly, it reminds me a lot of the depiction of Islamist cells. In the years after 9-11, there were a lot of films where the Islamist cells were depicted uh, in very much the same way. And the reason is because they have no roots in the community. They, they have no recourse except to walk into a shop and buy these totally unsuitable mixtures of chemicals for what they're doing. Uh, and that leads to all the really unsafe things that we see in the film. You know, if you have, for example, organizations that have uh, deep roots in their community that uh, exist for a long time um, in countries like Ireland and lots of other countries that have had insurgencies, let's say, those organizations never have, don't and never will have any problem with getting their hands on the chemicals, the kind of chemicals that are shown in this film in like unadulterated form where they can be worked with in a reasonable way. And the reason for that is because those kind of chemicals exist in the community, in the economy, because they have to, in an industrial economy, they're used and therefore um, they're available to any organization that has deep roots in the community. You know, it's pretty straightforward. So I think that's the original problem, which then leads them to depict all of these really unsafe things that we can now consider. And, uh, do you want to look at some like concrete examples of that so that we can um, show the viewer what I mean when I say that? I think that would be really helpful if you could look at some concrete examples of what you're discussing. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, well, we could start with the, the young guy who's the, the group's kind of bomb maker. Um, so he's a teenager. 
Um, he gets his insights about these things from the internet, naturally. And uh, at one point in the film, he says that the the primary charge that they're preparing is made from something called lead azide. Now, that would not be considered by any means to be an absurd choice, but the, he says the nitric acid they're preparing for this is produced from, I think he says, uh, stump remover and drain cleaner. Now, that's, I would say, just as concerning as it sounds. That's crazy stuff. Uh, to, to For the avoidance of any doubt, unless you're a chemist, okay, there's no possibility that you can safely synthesize anything from products that are not chemically pure and that you do not understand the properties of. So, you know, what what does the film what are the filmmakers trying to do by sh setting this as an example, I wonder. Now, they do they do show him having various chemistry accidents during the film, so they're not suggesting he knows what he's doing. But because everything succeeds in the end, you get the impression that still they're saying that this is something that, you know, both could and should be emulated. In fact, at one point in the film, one of the characters says as they're driving along in a vehicle, you better not hit any potholes, right? And the vehicle contains these primary charges that this guy has made. And it gives the viewer the impression that these things are so sensitive that if you hit a pothole, it could cause them to, to detonate. If they've made something that's that unstable and that dangerous to themselves, then again, what are they doing? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, they should stop what they're doing immediately in that case. So I think the filmmakers on the one hand were trying to say, this is so dangerous, nobody should be doing anything like this. But that's contrary to the stated kind of aims of the film. Um, and I think all they actually succeed in doing is saying to someone who who is determined to do something like this anyway, who, who's, who you know is going to try to emulate what's in the film, they give the impression that, well, this is just an implied risk of doing this kind of thing. And so there's no, uh, there's no way a, a, a sort of around that. And it's just the risk that you have to take on. And in reality, it's not. So uh, you could take Ireland as an example, um, where over a very long period of time, um, people who were doing things like this uh, developed a sort of culture of quality control, of safety, and so just like anything else, any other uh, industrial production system. And so, you know, you can look at the, the contrast at the beginning of the of the conflict in Ireland in the late nineteen well early nineteen seventies. There were dozens of IRA volunteers that were killed while manufacturing and transporting explosives because they didn't have that safety culture and they were doing things in a much more homemade sort of way. And then by the 1980s, late 1980s, they had really eliminated that because they had introduced these kind of uh, standards. You know, um, So it seems to me that the filmmakers in this case are in the case of this movie, are calling for action, but on the basis of very unsafe and irresponsible technical procedures. And I don't think there's any excuse for that. To give you another example, at one point, uh, the same character is using a metal knife to place this primary explosive material into uh, the housing of a detonator, or a blasting cap, as the Americans say. And uh, this is highly dangerous because contact between the metal knife and the metal housing of the detonator could quite easily cause the ignition of the of the explosive material um, because the explosive material, the primary charge is highly temperature sensitive. And that's assuming that it's synthesized completely correctly and desensitized under laboratory conditions. Um, assuming that, um, it's an incredibly uh, um, irresponsible thing to show, but they're not even assuming that. They're assuming something much worse than that, that this uh, that this material is uh, is not properly prepared. I can continue then, I can say like, you know, in that same scene, this detonator is uh, packed with explosives and it shows them, it shows this guy putting it in a wooden box and then that wooden box is placed in a metal box and this is supposed to provide protection to him. And he, he then uses a wooden dowel to, to push down on the explosive and this is supposed to pack the explosive into the detonator. We then see a, a big explosion, right? So. How do we account for such a big explosion, given the fact that it's such a small device, it's such a small amount of uh, of material? Well, it may be more than meets the eye. I mean, we have to assume it is based on the explosion that they show. It can be typical, for example, for a detonator to have multiple stages. It can have more powerful grams of explosives in there as well, and that would make it more powerful. So with that in mind, that it's powerful enough that it could certainly hurt this guy, the setup that's depicted is just totally unsafe. Obviously, the little boxes that he has there for protection, they just blew apart. 
uh, in the explosion, so they didn't offer him any protection. And the fact that this all happens, um, the explosion, I mean, indicates that, you know, in the first place, the material that he's made is totally unsafe to be working with. Um, if you had properly prepared materials, th this wouldn't happen. I think it's important to understand as well that the whole point of packing explosive material in this way uh, is that when the explosive material takes the form of a solid rather than a powder, that has desirable properties as far as the explosion is, as far as it's concerned as a detonator. Now, when these things are made in a factory, the way that it's done is by using an industrial pressing machine, and that exerts a huge amount of pressure, which causes the powder to turn into a solid. Very much the same as how sweets or tablets are made. It begins as a powder, an industrial pressing machine is used with such a, a large amount of pressure that it maintains that solid shape. Now, instead of that, what we have here is a young kid pushing down on a wooden dowel with his own body weight. So you can see why that doesn't really even make sense. If you did have an appropriate pressing machine here, which would exert tons of pressure onto this explosive material, then of course, appropriate safety conditions would need to be there. It would need to be operated from a distance, safely separating the person from the charge in the unlikely event of a detonation. So again, it's troubling to me. Why would the filmmakers depict something that both doesn't make sense and also is extremely dangerous from the point of view of this young guy and potentially of any viewer that would want to replicate what's being shown there? Another uh, scene in the film we can talk about uh, is one in which a circuit board is being soldered while it's connected to a battery. Well, that isn't exactly a huge safety risk, although it is possible that uh, a battery could leak or explode if it's exposed to heat for a long time. But mainly it's just very stupid because, look, this, uh, this circuit that we're shown clearly is supposed to have high current and low current elements. The low current element is dealing with some kind of wireless receiver. And the high current element is dealing with this igniter or initiator that this guy has made. And so obviously if a short circuit was made in on a circuit board like that, uh, and it's connected to a battery already, you're dealing with potentially the destruction of your circuit board. So it's very, it's a very, um, you know, kind of stupid thing to show, uh, but it's not particularly unsafe. I mean, it's not, the guy isn't going to get hurt by this. So it's not the worst thing in the film by any means. I would say for me, the worst scene in the film comes uh, an hour and a half in. And in this scene, it's really incredible. A candle is used to drop hot wax directly onto a detonator, which a character is holding in her hands. Now, the result of this would very likely be the ignition of the of the detonator, of the explosive charge. And with it, the, the, the girl would lose her hand. So this is really a quite unbelievable scene, in my opinion. I think she mentions in this scene that she says, well, the seal is broken, so we're using this hot candle uh, wax to repair the seal. So what they're doing is they're dropping hot wax directly into onto the opening of the detonator. And yeah, very, very, uh, just an extraordinary thing to show, extremely unsafe. There were also, uh, I could mention, um, other scenes in the film that showed things that would have, procedures that would have rendered the devices that they made ineffective. Now, that was probably done to ensure that anyone copying the film would make the same mistakes. And that's understandable. Um, and because it's not dangerous to anyone uh, to show something that would make it ineffective, um, you know, there's no need for us to talk about that. But it's, uh, it's still noteworthy that they included those things. So um, in general, just uh, those were the main scenes I wanted to, wanted to talk about today. So in general, my, my feeling on it is, you know, in terms of the storyline, if they were going to make a film like this, I think the only responsible storyline from a technical point of view would be to say that the characters met some kind of like sympathetic expert, someone from the mining industry or from the US military or from demolition or something like that. And this person understands these technical issues. And then the group is able to proceed on that basis. So that, that's what I was talking about earlier when um, discussing how an organization with roots in the community would have access to all of the the correct knowledge, the correct uh, understanding of how all these things work. Without that, 
yeah, you've got this these kinds of extremely dangerous scenes. Unbelievable. And yeah, I think from a Marxist perspective, we would just we would say that this would be correctly identified as adventurism, you know, people substituting the mass base for small groups of you know individuals who are completely disconnected. So yeah, absolutely unbelievable. Now, without venturing too far into the realm of speculation, can you think of any reasons why this movie might potentially be showing such harmful activities like this? Well, I definitely think that the question of US state security consulting, which we now know happened on this film, supposedly for activists, it has to be questioned. Did they have influence on the production of the film? If they had, um, was it at their suggestion, for example, that this group be shown as knowing that they were infiltrated by the FBI, but continuing with their plan regardless and then succeeding? That's a very strange storyline. And you know why would that be the story that they want to tell as environmentalist activists? Next, were the dangerous methods that were shown in this film in terms of handling explosives, things that we've looked at now, um, were those things added into the film at the initiative of the state security advisors? I think that's a, a question that would have to be answered. Did nobody raise concerns at some of these things that are obviously unsafe? Did nobody say, let's have an independent expert just like assess this, just see if it's uh, if it seems if it seems correct? So. For me, it's very troubling. It raises the question, what were the filmmakers thinking that they were trying to achieve with all of this? And then having done that and kind of being aware of these issues, as they must have been, why are they then putting on their website a call to action for people to emulate what's shown in the film? So I think there's a lot of questions there that uh, hopefully will give the viewer a lot to think about. Don Locustela, thank you very much for your time and your contributions. Thank you, Paul. Donald's currently working on a socialist economics book with Tom O'Brien, which you can stay up to date with at their website, theclasslesssocietyinmotion.org. You can also follow Donald on Twitter, at DonaldOC91. Both are linked in the description box below. Now, the purpose of this video, despite the dramatic title, is not to suggest that everyone involved in the creation of this film is part of some grand conspiracy to sabotage the environmental movement. In fact, it's much more likely that most of the people involved in this production are very well intentioned and have no idea that this film is spreading such dangerous misinformation. After all, how could they be expected to know the specifics of safely creating explosives? I certainly wouldn't. What's much more likely is that certain people involved in the production were manipulated and misguided by the US military official in order to foil and sabotage any potential future attacks that this production might encourage. Both Andreas Malm, author of the original book, and Daniel Goldhaber, director of the film, have been contacted by Marxism Today for comment on this matter. So far, neither have responded, but if and when there are any developments, we'll make sure to keep you up to date as they happen. In the meantime, don't go getting yourselves hurt. Stay safe out there and look after yourselves and your comrades. You're no help to anybody dead. Gurv mil ma guiv, agus